Um, first off, how many people have been to one of my random talks before? How many have realized that I have a propensity for doing like loads of things that ramble and go way over time or make things really overcomplicated, have like reliance on live code and like external dependencies? Um, I thought I'd try and avoid doing that for a change and thought it'd be a good idea to actually write the speech first. Now, obviously I've already completely gone <coughs> off that, but you know, that's life. So um, what are we here for? Um, I'm gonna be talking about data art and creative collisions. And I'm just gonna kick off straight. Uh, the technology community is known for being strongly inwardly looking to the point of being myopic at times. We focus on techniques, on products, on languages, and on frameworks, on best practices, and we consider success and failure based on usually concrete facts and evidence. Did it pass the CI? Is the Kanban board clear? Did our KPIs indicate a winner between A and B? Did we get more traffic this month than last? Did we increase throughput on the pipeline? Did we increase security coverage? Did we get more signups this month? How is our, MMR, our MRR curve? This empirical approach to development and creation is far from unique to our industry, but quite often the outcomes of this line of work can be cold and deeply impersonal. We occasionally find ourselves looking over at other industries and activities like education, art and politics with a mix of derision and just a little bit of jealousy that they can get away with some of the bullshit. Um, However, some of the best outcomes and experiences come from pushing and stretching our boundaries outside of the safety of our wee community. In this talk, I'll be sharing a little bit of my background just for context and discussing some of the creative collisions that I've come across from using VR technology to enable creative expression for disabled musicians, uh, empowering artists to use electronics to connect their art to the wider world, and using science to derive uh, pu uh, public policy and political engagement. And along the way, I'll hopefully be proving that I can actually pull off a talk with less than 100 slides and without resorting to Python or slides with just text just to piss off Chris Nixon. <laughs> so my professional, right, this is like, for most people in this room, this is the first time you've ever seen me with hair. Um, and for another half, it's the first time seeing me without a beard. Uh, my professional background has wandered through a few fields over the years from taking things apart at a young age and always having a few screws left over at the end and getting robotic dogs to piss on headmasters. Um, eventually turning that skill set into something akin to a trade by studying electronics and software engineering at Queen's, during which I got to test the launch of 4G networks in China from the grey comfort of an office in Athlone. Uh, Moonlit as a technology consultant for a marketing and advertising firm in Belfast for a while and spent a summer developing BIOSes for embedded computers in Switzerland. After that, just in time for the financial crisis to make everyone question their career choices, I careered down the academic culvert to a PhD, stealing shamelessly from the sociologists to make their science vaguely useful by teaching autonomous military submarines how to trust each other. More recently, not with these guys, I worked with a bunch of psychologists to teach machines how to understand... Wow, that's bright. Um, <laughs> But, sorry, got it fine. How to understand human emotions using biometrics and wearable tech. And now in my current role as a data scientist at Alert Logic, whoop, whoop, um, we, uh, I, I get to play with terabytes of data trying to read the minds of hackers and script kiddies across the world who are throwing everything they can at some of the internet's biggest in institutions. But beyond the technical side, I was part of the team that built Farset Labs almost eight years ago. And as it stands, Farset is Northern Ireland's only hackerspace, not any competition yet, but bring it on. Um, and at least in my opinion, it stood the test of time as being a relatively neutral ground in a technology ecosystem that was historically beset with silos and egos. Anyone recognize this map? I'm not saying we're perfect. Um, but I hope that those of us in the room that remember what the tech community was like in Belfast a decade ago would agree that we've come a hell of a long way towards getting better at working with each other across the barricades of front end versus back end, fintech versus academia, Python versus R, and so on. And um, we're, even, we're even close to a peace deal between Vim and Emacs, but only if Emacs agrees to a Vim language act, so I'm not holding my breath. <laughs> Part of that ever closer union has been driven by the adoption of technology itself. Meetup is a great example of this. It's enabled the collaboration and knowledge sharing within and across the tech community in a way unimaginable a few years ago. 
But more important than that, in my opinion, is, has been the connection of personal networks and experiences across the industry. And those interwoven connections have gone a long way towards enabling the rapid dissemination of stories, experiences, questions and answers. And that, in my opinion, defines this as a tech community rather than just being the Northern Ireland tech industry. And that's where we start to get to the point of my talk, a whopping five minutes and 25 seconds in. Um, I'm going to set everyone in this room a challenge. This year, do some kind of collaboration outside the tech industry and do a lightning talk at NIDC 2020. But that's a bit of an ugly challenge to give you without any examples. So what do these collaborations look like? How do they work? And what kind of impacts do they make in the real world? So I'm going to go through some of the examples that I've have, have had the joy of coming across over the past few years, covering the dynamic and subjective world of the arts. But first, we're going to tackle the great bureaucracy that runs the world that is the public sector. For anyone who's worked with or in the public sector, whether that's in local government, healthcare, community organizations, or in any other capacity, it would be very difficult to honestly describe any of their operations as agile, innovative, dynamic, or at least in the same sense that we would at least pretend to use those words within the tech sector. But for all of their perceived sins, the public sector is acutely aware of this deficiency, and God love them, they are trying. One particularly interesting project, both from a political and a technical and indeed an economic point of view, was a small business research initiative, or an SBRI, uh, challenge that came from Land and Property Services um, around streamlining the assessment and collection of business rates. Now, before everyone falls asleep, I'm going to start this a little bit off with the outcomes and then work backwards. Partnership between an old boring pen and, pen and paper um, rates body and a couple of data-driven startups, married with access to loads of uh, government open data and even internal data, cost about 60 grand to run the proof of concept for over a course of nine months to build a machine learning based model that identified within nine months half a million pounds of additional rates, uh, rateable income. How often do you hear about government tech projects that break even, let alone turn a profit? Um, the, the key insight that they arrived at was that by gathering all of this information and location and service related open data together and looking at their multidimensional outliers and running all their analysis, making all these very complex, and I'm sure it took an awful lot of work and research, went into the perfect combination of metrics to work out what was wrong and using all these super duper powerful things. However, whenever they got to the end of it, they discovered one single factor that identified more uh, rentable rate or rateable missing rateable organizations uh, than anything else. It was the lowly food hygiene ratings. And it's really simple. If they have one, they should probably be paying rates. The organization that did the rating, or sorry, that did the Food Standards Agency stuff, never talked to LPS. And that this collaboration was the first time that somebody asked, hmm, it's a bit weird that they've got a scores on the doors and they're not paying for their doors. Um, but. Tech collaborations don't have to be at this scale of a government procurement process or even specifically to do with the application of technologies directly. Um, at Farset, we had the pleasure of working with the Northern Ireland Voluntary and Community Agency, or NICVA, um, on stealing some of the practices and, and protocols that we use in the tech industry, um, having to uh, generate new projects. And we constructed this as a, uh, as a, a policy called policy hacking. Um, now, for anyone who's been in a design thinking workshop or a well-managed hackathon or has worked in a decently operated scrum process, will recognize the ideas of starting with a user-focused, solution-oriented journey of problem identification, open discussions across organizations, uh, and bringing people from all levels of the hierarchy, prototyping and rapid iteration. Most of that entire paragraph, local government doesn't understand most of the words of, let alone the concepts of, but this is something that's ingrained in us as an industry. This kind of attitude, uh, I've actually just completely repeated myself there, fantastic. Um, <laughs> after facilitating about a dozen or so of these, has this all gone? No, no, just a little bit. After facilitating about a dozen of these policy hacks on different things, ranging from justice to healthcare to criminology and everything like that, um, the, this allowed NICFA to put together a, a cross-cutting strategy that was actually put together in their submission for, I think it was the 2017 program for government. Now, um, if anyone remembers anything about 2017, uh, th this outcome came just in time for the assembly to basically shit itself. Um, uh, and as, but we, we can sympathize with that. Uh, we're all aware that you can have all the plans planning and all the frameworks in the world. And if the C-suite still shits on you from a great height, uh, it's just going to happen. So I guess we've got that in common with the public sector. 
Now, if only there was something we can do about it. Now, this section was literally added during uh, Brian's talk before this, so I apologize for typing through it because I was trying to get it through. But um, how many people have seen the electionsni.org website? Okay, um, how many people are going to look at the electionsni.org website after this? That's more like it. Um, so uh, this was basically a load of political wonks who were hanging around in the counting stations, submitting their data to a, or de submitting the live count data as it was coming in to a couple of data wonks in the background and turning them into some relatively nice graphs. I didn't have time to turn these into GIFs, I'm sorry. Um, we've actually just restarted this collaboration. Um, so if anyone would like to get involved in any analyzing, understanding, and presenting election and political data in a meaningful way, please give me or Bob Harper or Colin Burns a shout. Um, outside of classical government or community group activities, the tech world is facilitating amazing grassroots public policy debates. One of the more exciting ones that I've seen recently coming down the road is a project kicked off by our own local boy, Stephen Highlands, if anyone knows him. Um, the Climate Fixathon is a four week remote hackathon for tech professionals to use their skills to prevent climate breakdown. I'm technically spoiling Stephen's big reveal because he's doing a meetup later in this week where he's supposed to be announcing it. So yeah, I hope this video doesn't go live too quickly. Anyway, it's gonna run from the 15th of July and is built around three pillars, raising awareness, taking action and enabling facilitating platforms. And in the context of my challenge from earlier, yes, working on this would count. Now we get into the really dangerous bit where we've got like audio and shit. Um, so beyond the normal public policy set, um, there are also some really awesome collaborations and prototypes coming out of related sectors like tourism. And while I know you came here to see the nice art stuff, not the boring public stuff, I just wanted to show you this system uh, from Virtual Visit Tours. Uh, they've, uh, I think it's just been installed in W5 as part of their new exhibition space. They took hundreds of uh, 360 and stereoscopic vi uh, videos to create an, a mobile AR experience that can transport you from any place with a flat floor uh, to one of a dozen or so tourist sites across the province. Has he walked through it yet? I do actually quite like the bit whenever he walks through because it really sells it. So you actually do get to wander through the portal and wander around. And one of the nice things about it is that you can just see that these are actually videos. So you also get the audio playing through as well, which is the first time that I've seen that deployed in a meaningful way. Yeah, it's fun. Um, uh, sorry for anyone who's uh, like afraid of heights. Should have given you a warning. But why I suspect most of you dropped into this talk instead of the fantastic sessions that I'm competing with and gonna be watching whenever the videos are released is the crossover between technology and the arts. One of the most satisfying projects I've been part of recently is a collaboration called Vrim, 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 Vrim um, or VR, rea or virtual reality inclusive music making. This is between the Drake Music Project, Queens' Sonic Arts Research Center, and uh, Farset. Uh, the goal of this project was to, or is to give disabled musicians the power to express themselves musically and eventually visually, um, but ask me about that one later, um, uh, using maker accessible uh, electronics and virtual reality tech. This was born out of our previous collaboration called Performance Without Barriers, where Sark and Drake worked with the HTC Vive to develop physically responsive virtual reality instruments tailored to the experience of the uh, musicians themselves. This is Mary Louise um, under a very, very expensive mask. Um, she has cerebral palsy, which makes it very difficult for her, uh, her to control her movements, uh, especially in the kind of fine motor control that you would usually need to engage in the creative field. Using a Hive game called EXA, um, the, I think it's EXA, the infinite instrument, uh, they were able to construct what I like to think of as sonic curtains. Um, I'll jump over to the next one, where there were four spots of VR space around her where she could effectively play like a, a virtual symbols almost uh, that had four set, sets of different chords. Um, they were able to customize the musical structure around her for her own range of, uh, and rate of motion. And um, very quickly, Mara Louise became proficient enough to be able to perform in front of an audience of dozens of people at a concert, a concert in Sark, along with a few of our old and new friends that were working on similar projects. Another related project with a PhD researcher called Alex, who, um, who's working with another disabled musician uh, with multiple profound disabilities called Owen. I'm just gonna let this run in the background. I hope the audio was not too big on this one. Um, so what they've been co-developing is a virtual guitar based on a sip blow switch that you can see Alex um, handing Owen at the minute. And that's where he's a lot, uh, he can choose what chord he wants to play. And then if we skip ahead a bit, um, don't know whether we're actually getting audio, but what you'll be able to see. Oh, we, we can all get the idea. So you can see here that Owen's got a sensor in his hand and basically as he rolls his arc down, that's playing different strings on the guitar. 
Uh, let's see what else. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, as part. Yep. Da, da, da. Sorry. Did I actually get one? Yeah, okay. As part of the Vrim project, we're uh, bringing strands of all these different work packages together, along with workshops for both artists and technologists to share experience and knowledge in things like electronics, embedded programming, games design, musical theory, music production techniques, to create a community of people designing and building devices and systems that can take some of the capabilities of something like EXA that Marie Louise used originally and make it more accessible, both in terms of price and interoperability. And if anyone wants to get involved in that, um, uh, I'll be in the project room this afternoon playing with some of the kit myself. Uh, moving slightly away from the musical side of things, uh, people who have been on the Farset Facebook page might recognize this if it loads. Uh, one of the very first in-your-face tech art crossovers I got to experience in Belfast was when an ex-theoretical physicist come sonic artist asked me if he could come into the workshop in Farset um, to build some monstrous light show with 5,000 LEDs and a load of sensors, all to build an interactive ping pong table that's been touring around the world. I'm going to skip over to this one because it actually shows it in action a bit better. So what we're looking at there is obviously they're playing ping pong, but the table is responding to the impact points using acoustic sensors at the corners. Um, so yeah, it's the ultimate worst Tetris game ever. Uh, where's my mouse going now? So and this is this is the one piece of text uh, for when the video feels miserably, but. Um, not to be outdone by himself, uh, Robin then kicked off a collaboration with an environmental scientist at the University of Birmingham to construct an Arduino-powered pollution sensor, testing it against uh, environmental-grade equipment to see exactly how useful $10 Chinese inputs are, uh, or imports are. Unsurprisingly, they're not exactly professional grade, but would go for broad brush strokes of how dirty is the air. And from a technical perspective, it could have stopped there. Maybe like a, attach a web dashboard to the thing. But instead, the kit was expanded to include another LED array. Robin likes his LEDs. And these flickered based on the amount of particulates that were detected in the air at that particular time. This was then taken on a global tour um, uh, where, uh, that I'm not at all jealous of to make a long exposure light painted photographs. So we would effectively have this pillar that would flicker and they'd just take a long exposure. And then over the course of a long exposure, this would be picked up. So this is Port Talbot. Um, I didn't get any good photos of whenever he was in Jakarta and a couple of other places. They're probably on his Twitter. Um, just damn, jammy bastard. Um, but Robin is someone who brings his STEM experience to bear to express his art all in one cat lovingly vaguely human shaped box. Seeing Robin's projects uh, and especially the, the reaction to these projects from both the arts and tech communities was a revelation uh, to me, some, uh, sitting somewhat on the periphery of both. The arts community saw him as some kind of dark wizard of electronica and then the tech community seemed to think, hey, that's a really cool way of presenting information. I'd have never thought of that, you crazy artist. Uh, and while Robin is a crazy artist and a dark wizard, one man can only give a shit about so much. Uh, so to make a real change in the world, I wanted to start building bridges. So for the past couple of years, and directly a result of an open data camp that was running in Belfast in 2017, I started a couple of occasional meetups um, that, uh, wait for it, that were called Title Drop Data Art. Um, the purpose of this meetup was to try and bring artists, designers, technologists, and creators together, mostly just to show off cool shit that we'd found, seen, or made ourselves. Myself, as a data scientist, I spent most of my, time, most of my presentations, such as, such as they were, explaining things like graph theory and machine learning concepts to bemused artists, while they schooled me on color theory and explaining in crushing detail how all my aesthetic choices were just plain wrong. At the end of the day, we, we weren't sharing or talking about abstract aesthetics or visualization or the computational complexity of particular analysis. We were sharing our understanding of the real world around us. We spent a lot of time analyzing our wee city here from geography and connectedness and mapping that to historical issues. And fun fact for that one, the West Link was originally planned to be an overpass, but the Army Corps of Engineers and the RUC at the time really liked the idea of being able to shut well, West Belfast off from the rest of the city at three choke points rather than dozens which is also why if anything goes wrong with the West Link, the entire city is shafted. Um, beyond looking at our environment, we also used the tools of math and technology and art together to understand our own lives and those of our families and communities, including an insightful journey in data logging by Brian Douglas's kid, or of Brian Douglas's kid, that would be very impressive. Um, and using that information in, and telling stories about how that information was used in a medical context to tell stories about trends that normally only parents couldn't recognize and that the medical professionals would often dismiss without evidence. 
But apart from just learning each other's crafts, uh, part of the purpose of these meetups was to start forming connections and relationships across the barricades of tech and art. And one of the relationships that developed between uh, Farset as an organization and an organization called Digital Art Studios based in the Cathedral Quarter, we ended up working on a program that DAS were running called Future Labs, which was uh, a, a explicitly a technical training program run by the arts organizations for artists, developing workshops on everything from AR, AI to, and this is projection mapping. I wish I'd got the video for this one where it's effectively rotating around because those are physical objects that are just being projected on, which are really, really nice. Uh, Farset hosted one of those workshops uh, about getting started with the Raspberry Pi, led by uh, the Dark Wizard himself. You can see him in the background pretending to know how to use a whiteboard. Um, uh, 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 where visual and sonic artists were given the space and opportunity to play with kit and prototyping equipment, normally only sought out, uh, available to engineers and, to, and uh, us lot, basically. And about eight months ago, uh, Robin, the bugger that he is, asked me to join the vo board of an organization called Vault Artist Studios. That's an art collective. It used to be the Belfast Bankers, if anyone remembers that. They were based out of the Ulster Bank building at the top of Royal Avenue and basically squatted for about a year. Um, and they've since taken over the old Biffy uh, on Tar Street in East Belfast. Uh, so this is a community of about 100 awesome and only slightly sane artists, designers, musicians and practitioners who are constantly pushing the boundaries of what's possible from building scale marble runs as in the scale of a building but not scale models that'd be a bit pointless um, and hula hoop shows to good old-fashioned analog chiptune visualizations and a totally legally par rated laser dong. Um, uh, so that was an awful lot of fun. This level of interdisciplinary collaboration is exceedingly rare, even in the arts world. And so far, if they vote me back in in the AGM next week, I hope to work to be a bridge between these sort of tech and art, arts worlds. So wrapping up and actually being on time for a change. Um, it's sometimes very intimidating to see these kind of projects and collaborations and say, I'm not good enough at the tech to help them to do that, or I'm not arty, or I, I, I don't know what to do. The fact is that these things all start off as conversations between a couple of people, working out some kind of shared language for their problems, ideas, solutions, and just seeing where that rabbit hole takes them. All it takes is a conversation. So I'm challenging you, all of you to find an arty friend or connection, and if you don't have one, ask me, um, and talk to them about your respective crafts, your challenges, your perspectives, and see if you can build something awesome together. Doesn't have to be useful, doesn't have to change the world, doesn't even have to be pretty. It can just be fun. Uh, uh, um, sorry. Uh, seeing how the palettes of data and art clash and complement. We're nearly there. Uh, you have a year, your time starts now. Thank you for your time, and I'm accessible at all of these things, and I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you. No questions, perfect, I can bugger off. <laughs> Shoot. Um, just looking at the uh, VR-based um, instruments that were given to people with different disabilities and how that can transform the way they work. Um, do you foresee any major challenges in disseminating that technology to artists? Or like, I guess the question is, what do you think some of the innovations will need to be in order to make that technology more accessible? Well, that's actually one of the purposes of the Vrim project. So the, the original one that we were talking about and the photos of Mary Louise were from the Performance Without Barriers project. That was basically, can we have a, a proof of concept, to see, a, a fluffy version of that this is hypothetically possible. And this was all using the, the lovely pricey Vive hardware and using customized software and everything like that. And that wasn't very extensible, wasn't very customizable. And you could see actually, I won't try and switch things back, but you could see, actually I will. Um, I'll see if I can get this right. Uh, one of the things that you'll notice about Mary Louise's setup in that case was that, there we go, um, that is not how you hold a Vive controller, um, but it is the way that was most comfortable for her. And fundamentally, that's the thing that you have to remember whenever you're looking at this. We need to be able to adapt and adjust these technologies in a meaningful way that we can customize it to the individual user's experience. Now, that's something that we're, we're kind of abstractly aware of in the tech world. 
Um, so one of the things, that, uh, one of the key parts of the Vrim project is to take this kind of high-end technology and break it down to, oh, it was good, I needed to find that adapter, um, and basically bring it down to stuff like this, where you've got accelerometer sensor and a battery pack that you can strap on anywhere, and then have that using open communication technology so that you can, ha you can mix and match uh, whatever different parts of a project that you're trying to bring together. We're currently working on having the integration capability to be able to send that sensor data over the internet, then back down through a local connection that can then be disseminated into Ableton or into Unity to be able to drive both audio and visual uh, interactivity in there. Um, so it's still very much uh, a work in progress. We're also looking at beyond just the electronics things, just while I see Matt lurking at the front, uh, we're also talking about bringing this in and just using being able to integrate consumer mobile devices into this and being able to say, you don't need to have the, the yes, relatively cheap, but still custom kit. You can just strap a Android or iPhone and then you can effectively play as part of the same collaborative musical instrument. So I hope that kind of answers your question. Just uh, to throw in on the end of that one, part of my philosophy in the Vrim project is that yes, we are looking at disabled musicians as the primary target, but all of these learnings, I mean, we're learning things about how to properly manage sensor data in embedded environments, how to manage things like MQTT timeouts, how you do cross configuration. Uh, and these are things that we want to make sure are fully open source, fully accessible, so that then, uh, shall we say, people can use them in whatever situation they want.